Okay, well, that's getting ready. How are we doing with Chris in the waiting room for our first delegation? Thanks, Jody. We are live now. Just waiting to the queue to see if our first delegate, Chris, is uh, prepared from Chiefs of Ontario. Hi, Nathan. It's Brooke. Um, Chris isn't in the waiting room yet. He has um, another meeting and he said he's going to log in as soon as he's finished that meeting. Okay. Um, so I will let you know as soon as he um, logs in. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to move us into the adoption of the political liaison minutes of October 24th. Give folks a minute to review those minutes and then I'll look for a mover. Yeah. I'll move. Just uh, got reminded, we're going to move back to number three, um, just to review and move the agenda. I forgot, I skipped right over it. Move, move by Audrey, is there a seconder? Second by Sherry Lynn. Any additions, uh, amendments to the agenda? Okay, hearing no additional items, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing a hearing on motion has passed. Thanks, Audrey. Moving back to the adoption of the political liaison minutes, I do note that uh, Sherry Lynn did move those. They're seconder. Hazel, seconded by Hazel. Any further discussion on the minutes? Hearing none. Motion has passed. Oh, wait, I have to go to the motion. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion has passed. Uh, looking to see if Rod is available. Oh, there he is. Hey, Rod, how's it going? Good morning. So council, we did uh, have a quick discussion at the environmental task force meeting in regards to an update from our legal as it relates to the um, First Nations uh, drinking water settlement. Um, so we do have a bit of an update and some options for you to look at and consider to kind of uh, uh, begin the discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rod uh, to provide uh, that quick update, and then I'll supplement with anything uh, at the end. Yeah, good morning. Um, so I know this has been a long-standing uh, file portfolio, um, and I apologize that uh, this came up rather quickly, so you won't probably see anything in your Dropbox in terms of a briefing note, but I had come to council previously, I think back in June, and there was a bank council resolution passed. At that time, um, I maybe it's just back up a little bit here. Um, in terms of how I became involved in it is, I guess, probably be around 2012 or 2014, I was working um, personally and privately on, uh, on the water security um, portfolio and, and the context that Six Nations has in terms of uh, seeking and pursuing water security for our community. So over, the, over since those, those last five years or so, I've been in contact with various players uh, on the drinking water First Nations drinking water file, whether it was uh, my participation in the Chiefs of Ontario, uh, uh, they have an environment committee or the AFN has an environment committee as well. So I've, I've been, um, I've seen presentations and updates from various uh, entities and parties on the class uh, action for drink, First Nations drinking water. Uh, and so I posed a bunch of questions. And so then um, I guess once the class settlement was reached and the way class settlements work is uh, if you meet the criteria between 1995, I believe, and 2021. I think that's a 25 year period. Um, and you've been on a do not drink advi water advisory for at least one year during those 25 years. 
that you, as, a, as an individual First Nation resident living on a, on a First Nation community, you meet the, the threshold criteria to apply for compensation through this, this national class settlement. So um, I know the various parties and entities and legal counsel uh, and advocates have approached the previous council and this council numerous times. Uh, and I know there are political and legal sensitivities in terms of the context for Six Nations. So it's not my place to get into those finer details, but uh, just to say, that um, a deadline is coming up. I think it's coming up in the first week of December for respective First Nations to opt in to this national First Nation settlement. So legal, legal advisors have uh, provided a little bit of context for Six Nations community in terms of what might be involved in that. It's, it's kind of an aggressive timeline. So we had, there was a discussion um, around those, those uh, circumstances and different options and whatnot. My focus, I guess, is, is more at the individual level. And, and I've, I've asked a lot of questions of the experts and the delegates over so many years about does, do individual households at Six Nations meet that threshold to apply for compensation under this class settlement? And the answers that I got uh, consistently was yes. Uh, theoretically, we, we do have individuals that from the period of 1995 until June of 2021, they definitely meet the threshold. The, the, the unique circumstance that we have here at Six Nations is a lot of those do not drink or boil water advisories are, are open-ended. And so that's probably a new, unique context uh, for Six Nations. So I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. But the other one is typically why six, we don't get a lot of uh, media coverage in terms of boil water advisories um, federally is because they, and I think the two newspapers picked it up the last time we had this discuss, open discussion is that there's this perception that because we have what they refer to as a, a state of the art water treatment plant facility, that uh, we don't have any uh, boil water advisories or drinking water, uh, water advisories. So typically the, when, you're, when I'm sitting at those tables and the government says, okay, um, you gotta, in order, we're, this is only looking at communal drinking water distribution system. So the threshold there is five households five households or more have to be hooked up to a communal drinking water system. So that's typically how in, in some of the meetings I've been to is the formula that they use to say, okay, this community's priority, this community's priority. And they look at those communal water systems. So because the village of Ashwigan gets their drinking water from a distribution system, that's considered a communal system. So there's different contexts as well. So there's uh, and, I, and, and just looking at the at our own unique situation as a community, there's been a, like there's there's segments of of timelines whereby, as a community as a whole, we probably meet the criteria, and then individually as a whole. So there's kind of two different class categories from from my perspective. And the one is before we got the water the, the current water treatment plant, we were getting water from the Mackenzie Creek, and so there was a water treatment plant there on Fourth Line Road, which is now the archives building. So I've got documentation and there's newspaper clips over the decades to say, um, you know, the, our, it was, there was much to be desired in terms of that, that uh, it was very, a, a, a kind of a, I don't wanna say, um, it was just a basic water treatment plant for the Mackenzie Creek. So it was just like you threw in a little bit of uh, aluminum and some other, uh, you added some um, chlor chlorine to, add, to kill the bacteria. So it was ru really rudimentary. And so as a consequence of that and some of the documents that I've read, um, the people that were hooked up to the distribution system then with the old water treatment plant were told not to drink that water. And there was fear, fear for it. So generation upon generation upon generation, whether you're in the village of Ashwigan or you're, uh, you're serviced by a your own private well, mm -hmm. um, people have just and just talking to people generally, no one really trusts the water. So then we, then we, we lobbied and then you, you saw the Brantford Expositor um, uh, exposés on, in 1990. I think that was, that was what uh, precipitated the funding to, to build the new water treatment plant. But back in, the back in those days, in the early 1990s, there were headlines and, and former late Bob Johnson was usually the spokesperson and said, Six Nations residents warned not to bathe don't drink the water. At that time, it was a, a compound or a chemical called NDMA. And they were trying to figure out where the source of it was. They pinpointed Elmira 
And that contaminant actually does, is persistent. It can travel quickly through the watershed and through water tables. But in, in the end, they said it was a function of uh, a byproduct of uh, uh, the chlorination process. So there's some technical uh, considerations in that regard. So to get back to, to the current issue at hand is that uh, under this class settlement, in order for uh, respective First Nations to opt in, they have to pass the BCR. And there's a template in one of the documents online, I think it's uh, Appendix D. Um, that does, so even if, if, the, if the council decides not to opt in because they wanna weigh other uh, legal or uh, political avenues um, for, to, you know, to spread the distribution system so it services the entire community, even if that's not, if the council, today does not decide to go that route, that that's, does not prevent individual households at Six Nations from um, applying for settlement under this class settlement act. So there's there's a lot to unpack there. I know it's 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 quite detailed now when you go to the website and you and how we how we brought this up again is when we had community members going to, once you know the media announced that the, the application process is now open and we I think it's only open till March. Like they've extended the deadline. Um, and you and you start to fill out the application form. You go to the website and you'll uh, you look at the uh, impact at First Nations, and you there's a drop down menu, and you look and you see Six Nations that isn't on there. So uh, what we what we endeavored to do, myself and Sarah Curly Smith, and with the help of Dwayne Jacobs, is we tried to create um, the documentation that the administrators would need to see in order to add Six Nations as an impacted community under the drop down menu. Um, we knew that was gonna be a, a, a more labor intensive and time intensive process if we were gonna go down the path of like a community wide um, endorsement of this class settlement. And I, I, you know, it's up to the council to decide if they wanna go that. I think that it's kind of too late this time around because of the deadline, the looming deadline. But on the individual side, um, we, we anticipate that yes, indeed. And I, and I have documentation too, so, um, I have documentation uh, to, to demonstrate to the class administrators that um, we have individual households. And, and the other argument that we'll probably hear is that, well, and, and that was one of, one of the cons legal considerations that got posed was, are individual households, do they even qualify for compensation under this class settlement? Because the th again, you have to be, it has to be a communal system with at least three households connected to that communal system. That's typically what the federal government will defer to. But, uh, you know, from a culture perspective, we can always refer back to the fact that um, we're the people of the longhouse. In, in any given household, you'll have the mom and dad, that's first generation. They could probably have three adult children. They probably have grandparents in there. So they meet the threshold of, you know, a combined, enhanced, extended, um, five family household. I mean, I don't think that they're gonna go that route because every question that I've asked so far seems to indicate that individuals um, can apply for this. And I think when just reading through some of the document there, it's so it's a 25 year time frame, um, And I think the base amount that individuals can get if they can demonstrate that they've been on a boil water advisory for every single one of those years, it's 2000 per year. And then there's another section where you can, there's other damages that you can apply for. So it's similar to the day school class settlement. Um, there's a, it's a, it is probably a, a labor and time intensive application process uh, uh, for people to do that. And the deadline is coming up, I think, and they've extended it to March or May. Um, so there'll have to be that determination. But I think the, the most important thing here now is uh, to, to get the documents into the class settlement administrators so that individuals and again, they will have they so a lot of these individual households will have their own records. They will have a record from Peter Hill, the Health Canada, or Paul Strohack, Health Canada, senior environmental health officer, saying, "Do not drink the water." So that meets the threshold. You have a qualified person, um, that being a Health Canada federal government representative, telling a resident on Six Nations not to drink the water. Again, the other unique context that I mentioned is a lot of them remained open ended. So. The example, real quickly, is you you get you test your water. It's got you find out it's got E. coli and coliform. Um, you you went to new directions and you got you self you did the self um, testing thing and you get your results back and you have something that says do not drink the water unless you pour bleach in it or or what have you. 
a lot of times, because we didn't have a robust program for, for wellhead protection, source water protection and wellhead protection, which means the, the wellhead, whether it's a 40 foot dug well, which has those, um, I guess they're three inch or three foot or to four foot diameter. Those are the big concrete ones that you see on a lot of, of the front lawns. The, the wellhead has to be protected under provincial regulations. So I think the top three tiles have to be properly sealed and they have to have a verm, vermin proof lid. Because we didn't have a robust program for households in the community to pursue that, there was no sense in going back every subsequent year and testing the water to say, is it safe to drink now? I think they it was just an open end. Okay, they told us not to drink that water, so we're not gonna we're not gonna drink it. Um, there was one one document that I saw from 1996, August of 1996. that came from Health Canada, and there were a number of wells that were tested back in 1995. So it's a little bit before the threshold. But the fact is, in 1996, um, a lot of the there was quite a few. There's quite a few wells where they said Health Canada said it's chemically unsatisfactory to drink this water. So, okay, so what do we do in that case? In some cases it had lead and had some other contaminants in there that are um, exceed provincial drinking water standards. So it's not safe to drink that water. So we might not have a record each subsequent year to say we tested it in 97, 98, 99 and so on, but they, they remained open end, end it. So that's one of the unique circumstances that will have to be impressed upon the administrators if they ask for additional information. Uh, at my, my initial sense is where we're at right now is <clears throat> the, the looming deadline. So we need, we need the appropriate document sent to the administrators to say we have, we have and here's a, here's a couple examples. We have examples of resident, individual residents at Six Nations who meet the criteria and they want to apply for compensation through this class settlement. So I know that's a lot to unpack, so I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Rod. And, and it is a lot to unpack going forward. So I do see some questions going up before I get, before I get to them. Just wanted to provide a little additional information on um, a lawyer. Sorry, I'm getting feedback from someone. <laughs> um, just wanted to provide some additional information on who the lawyer is. Um, so and um, Robert, as you guys are familiar with Robert, he's also uh, provided Rod and I, as well as the team with some additional legal advice as it relates to this particular issue. Uh, so that's why we're here. Um, there is the looming deadline. Uh, we do have to make a, a call either way um, uh, to get to work on, on whether or not uh, we are going to continue to pursue um, the application. Uh, both from a community standpoint, but also to allow our residents to uh, effectively apply through this uh, particular settlement as well. Uh, as Rod's laid out, there are uh, nuances with how um, different communities receive boil water advisories. Uh, and he did point out because we have that state of the art, we don't get the necessary um, Health Canada issued ones like other First Nations do, but we do have the evidence to prove that uh, we do have the equivalent um, going forward. So I just wanted to kind of provide those things and then I'm going to go to the questions. First I had Hazel and then Greg and then Audrey. Uh, yes, I would just like to... How do I stop that feedback? I would just like to talk about uh, this water situation that we've endured, not for the last few years, but in our case, for 55 years, we've had um, water problems at our location. Um, when we first built there, we uh, had a drilled well. When the well uh, was activated into the house, it was all sulfur water. You can imagine the smell and the horrendous um, pipe conditions where it kind of eats away at your pipes. So it was costly. So then we got a dug well and with a dug well, then you have some, like we had a, it all installed properly, like Rod said with those three, is it three feet? There was um, um, tiles that go down into that well. Well, that when that water was tested too, it was not safe water. 
So then we started to connect to a cistern. And throughout those years, even though we had um, attempted to have our own water, we've had to buy water all those years and um, either put them into those wells, which would drain really fast because the jip plant was draining everybody's wells in that area. So you were putting water in, jip plant was taking it. And um, when the state of the art um, system over here across the river, um, we start coming into town, but the bills that we paid for water are horrendous. There was one week where we had to get um, probably like two loads and all the water would drain out and the, and the loads were almost $100 each. So I, I think somewhere I have all of those bills and what we have paid throughout the years is a horrendous amount trying to have decent water. So if that doesn't fit the criteria of this um, first class lawsuit on our water problems here, I don't know what would. It seems like everybody in our area has had the same experience as us. It's not just us, it's our whole neighborhood because we're all in that locality of the gypsum company. So I don't know what else to say. Like uh, literally I'm tired of what's happened because we've been waiting to have our water installed for this is two years and they still haven't come to put the water line in. So I don't know. Thanks for that, Hazel. And, and you described exactly some of the situations uh, that we're trying to address mm -hmm. um, with the individual aspect of things yeah. and, and the application. Okay, okay so next I'm gonna to go to Greg, Greg and then I have Audrey and, uh, as well as Melba. Yes, uh, I, uh, I think it was back in the 90s, my, um, it was, uh, my brother Jeff Fraser was, um, was a chemical engineer and he went, I didn't think he went door to door, but he went to various households uh, testing water. Um, that was his expertise. He was, uh, he was an expert in water. Uh, he had found that, um, and I wish I could get his records, and I will look for them, um, but he had found that most of the wells that he had tested had either uh, high levels of various chemicals or uh, E. coli, um, and that he then applied for a grant with the federal government, which he did win, but uh, during that time he passed away, um, so that was sort of shelved. And um, so there has been a history. He also, I think, went to uh, the Canadian gypsum and wanted to uh, investigate, I guess, uh, their, their, their use of water and how it would contaminate the groundwater. But he didn't get very far on that. Um, and anyway, uh, he, did, he did conclude that uh, there was a very a large need for uh, cleaning wells, cisterns, and any type of, because a lot of people collected their water through runoff. And um, he also looked at the groundwater effects uh, from the dump and that it was quite extensive. So there is evidence, there is a sort of a historical evidence, but it's not clear, it's, uh, which may be difficult, I guess, to, um, to use. But anyway, I, I would be, uh, I'd be in favor of a, a council support as a communal uh, application um, and then see where it goes. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for that, Greg. Okay, just waiting for the mutes and the unmutes to happen and they did, so I'm gonna turn it to Audrey. Yeah, I agree with the communal as well as I agree with individuals have, having the ability to do a, do a lawsuit. And I, I guess my question uh, to you, uh, Rod, is where can the average individual go, go to get the test results of their place if they don't have those documents to say that they had lead in there or they had E. coli in their well? And, uh, you know, they could be, have been uh, paying for water for the last 30 years 
and those bills do add up. So hopefully there'll be some relief. So if you could ask, ask answer that question, I would appreciate it. Yeah. I'll go over to Rod just to see if he has a quick response. Yeah. <clears throat> so we do have records. So um, from the 1996 one, so the one I mentioned about lead and T THMs, I think it was. Um, so Health Canada, um, uh, they wrote a letter at the time to the chief. Um, we would have to go through the, rec the archive records, probably at health services, as depending on who the director of health was at the time to see, or the community health representative. So they, they referred to them as CHRs um, back in that, in, in that time era, um, to see uh, if, they, if they were CC'd. I know the modern um, routine here is when Peter Hill writes a letter, he will CC um, uh, Six Nations Health Services. So they will have records of of letters that went out to individual households. But in this case, these documents, and I actually did obtain them from Peter, Peter Hill. He went to Health Canada headquarters and he pulled them out and um, he printed them off. And I, so I do have access to them. Um, so we do, have, we do have the names of individual <coughs> um, community members um, when they tested the well back in 1995. Um, of the, of the so we like and that's that's what the what the legal counsel had wanted to see is do we have actual uh, documentation to prove that there was a, a do not drink and the answer is yes we do so but in terms of of now for for modern day or current day household heads of households to try to find their own records um, I guess that there might be some houses maybe the vast majority would have retained those letters uh, signed by Peter Hill or, or Paul Strohack or another entity to say, do not drink the water. Um, but we would it, would, it would take a little bit of a time on our side to access the records through archives um, to see if we can pull those out. I have, like I said, I have um, some documentation that was provided by Health Canada and it does have uh, the, the results for, for um, individual residents. So that, that would be helpful in that regard. Okay, thanks for that, Rod. I'm going to go next to Melba and then Sherry Lynn. And then May, Nate. And then Carrie. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry, Nathan, I can't always hear you. Yeah, I'm similar to Hazel that uh, certainly have been troubled over the years. I had lived on Cuga Road between uh, Atkins Corner and Beavers Corner, and we did get the advisory some years ago it, it appears to be maybe 25 years i'm not sure but we spent a lot of money on uh, jugs of water as well as uh, a bottle of water and what we had to do is change the it's called a foot valve several times over the years and that was expensive and getting someone to go down the well and draw that foot valve out and then put it back in so I think that uh, community as well as individuals should should uh, have the opportunity to apply for this class action. Thanks. Thanks for that, Melba. Um, next, going to continue down the list to Sherry Lynn and then Carrie. Yeah, Sherry Lynn. Um, yeah, I think this is very important. Um, it's going to be, I guess the next thing is having enough manpower with the applications and someone to be able to help them with the applications because I know Rod <laughs> and the department is overwhelmed with stuff. So is trying to figure out um, who would be able to assist with um, for the community members with the applications and some direction also. Yeah, and, and I think it'll be less for this particular situation because community members are already filling out applications. That's not the issue. The issue is we're not accepted in in the um, the class action. Okay, so then my follow-up question is, I guess the thing is to get it out to the community yeah. so more people can apply to, to apply. And then when more people know who's going to be able to help that high volume with the application. 
no, I think those are, are the readiness pieces that we'll need um, in terms of that sequencing. Next, we have Carrie. And yeah, um, Rod, Rod, is there any way of knowing that if the underground streams, the groundwater is all connected? Say if something got in a well on one road, is it possible that it could show up in somebody else's well further down or across the road or wherever? Is there, is there any way of knowing that? Uh, yeah, uh, Councillor Nathan can answer. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so there, there has been a, I think it was a Negan Burnside uh, hydrogeology uh, study. Um, I think it had to do with um, the landfill and whatnot. There's been various studies over the decades. Um, the, the the context that you raised, though, Councillor Kerry, is is a interesting one because of the fact that now we've been alerted. Um, by the Ontario Geological Survey and the province of Ontario that all of the drilled wells on Six Nations could potentially be super saturated with, with hydrogen sulfide. Um, and it could be in terms that we don't know yet, it'll have to be determined further. It could be a, a, a factor, um, a, a function because they're of their close proximity to an abandoned natural gas well. So um, the hydrocarbons from the natural gas well could be seeping into the deep drilled wells and it could be creating hydrogen sulfide. And so we already had that discussion about the hydrogen sulfide, but in terms of your, your, your question about the hydrogeology, yes. Um, the Ontario Geological Survey basically um, mapped all the groundwater in Southern Ontario with the exception of Six Nations. And there's a little uh, um, spot, I think near Windsor where they haven't really fully tested the, the groundwater. And that was the question that always came up too, because I, as I mentioned, I was working on water security uh, for, for many years now. And the, and the whole notion of um, a commercial water bottle company taking extracting water from the upper reaches of the Grand River, what would be the domino effect in terms of the aqua, aquifers underground? So if you start depleting all of that water, um, and then what would be the impact? What, would all of our wells go, dr go dry here, our drilled well? So I, I, I pose a lot, it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big, uh, question that has not really been fully answered for the Six Nations context in terms of um, what is the connection between these different aquifers because there'll be confined aquifers, there'll be open aquifers, some of them will be recharged by um, glacial features like drumlins, um, there'll be groundwater discharge and whatnot. So, um, and we do have different, and it's based on soil and geology. So we do have a soil map for the for Six Nations and there's sections where there's there's sand, which, which, which allows the water to replenish quickly and recharge. And then there, for the most part, we have clay. And that's, that's from what I've read, that's the contributing factor of why, why our well water is so poor is because um, with the clay soil, all of the contaminants that, um, that run off from the surface run off into wells that are not properly sealed and, and whatnot. So there's not, I don't think there's a, a precise, uh, Answer to your question, Councillor Kerry. I just think that uh, there have been geological studies, and there's gaps in the information that's available for for the geology under Six Nations. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Rod and Kerry. Next, I have Helen, and then Hazel. Yeah, I uh, in, in in response to to Greg's comment, Jeff did do a really comprehensive geological geological study of the water. So that that great big report has to be around somewhere because I remember we read it, we went through it, we read it. Um, I got a letter years ago that I wasn't supposed to drink my water. Back then, public health was doing it, I think, because Ali Hill, if anybody remembers Ali Hill, she was the one that would go around testing water. And she was the one came to my house and then I got a letter saying I wasn't supposed to drink my water because it had these contaminants. It listed them. I think it listed some of them. I didn't keep it, the letter, but that was years ago. Um, so I know people got those letters. I know my sister got one that said she had E. coli and they couldn't drink their water. So there's been so many water studies done, like we just keep doing water studies, but we don't seem to be doing anything about the water. 
So I agree, we should we can get in on the settlement, we should be doing that. <clears throat> Thanks, Helen. And then we'll look to wrap this up, but we'll go to Hazel last. Okay, um, so we have a mover and seconder. Rod, if I can get you just to kind of walk us through the just the exact motion we're looking for on the communal side, uh, and then we'll look to focus in on, on the mover, seconder, and moving this motion. Yeah, so I know, I think is, yeah, I don't know if Tammy's online here. Um, the exact wording, I guess, in, in terms of the follow-up from uh, the call we had last week, um, and I, and again, I think there was, there might, there may have been some confusion on the part of, of Robert in terms of, because he didn't, he thought we were only referring to communal systems. So how, how households, uh, communal systems that were connected to at least five, uh, families, but again, it's, it's individual. So I think the motion that's needed here is, um, and that was the discussion we had last week is, um, like there's there's legal pros and cons. So, and I know we didn't, I didn't have time to get into that today and there was no follow-up briefing note, but I, my sense is that there, for the communal system, um, there's, there's if you, we, we do decide to go that route, there's one where they, um, and if you look on some of the websites that, that they're available, I think there's four or five First Nations that have opted out because they're pursuing their own, uh, their own action. But again, to go that route is very time and labor intensive and it's probably gonna take many more years to go through that. So, um, to, so if to, to, for the, for the, to get onto the list for the communal system now, um, the, the way they, they would, they, my understanding is that the way they would approach it is if they accepted it, there would be a lump sum payment and then they would pay for all, and then we would have to provide the names of, of all of the, like the band membership, and then they would just say, okay, uh, six inches of the Grand River, and then they would give a lump sum to the, for a community, communal um, water. And then there would be, I think a portion, only a small portion that they would pay out for uh, the remaining. So there's, and that's the thing is that it's, 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 it's pretty detailed. I think it would take more than what I'm qualified to do in terms of describing the legal uh, consequences of going, accepting either the two options for communal. I was focused again, just on the individual. And, and you, when you look online, there's a, I mentioned there's an appendix and they said, even if your First Nations opts out, you as an individual um, can still apply. And that was, that was what my, camp, my campaign and Sarah Curley Smith, um, what we had in, with Dwayne's help is we prepared the affidavit and the exhibits and to, to get those into the administrators before December 3rd. And then, um, there would have to be would have to be um, I would have I would have a greater comfort level if it if it was a legal um, review of the actual the actual BCR because we talked to one of the, the representatives and we also we are we already have a BCR supporting and I think a letter did go from the chief's office to the administrators already so I'm I I don't feel comfortable crafting the BCR for communal um consideration i think that would have to come from one of the legal counsel why, because why they're why yeah. yeah rod why don't we just do that why don't we uh, loop back in with the legal counsel and bring this back to a future meeting just so that we are tight on the um what we're asking for and good direction to uh, the legal counsel so we'll work with uh, robert jane uh between now and the next meeting to craft this motion out and actually probably provide a briefing Will that work? Yeah. Okay, looking to the mover and seconder for that. Good, good. Okay, question to Sherry Lynn. Is there time frame? Time frame Tomorrow. We only have till December 3rd. Yeah. So December 3rd. <laughs> I just want to, you know, the fall on the ground. Oh, yeah. We got to look if we have a meeting, right?
So let's have this back for general counsel on the 22nd. Will that work for you, Rod? Uh, give you a week to work with our legal counsel, craft the motion, get a briefing note, and we'll bring it back on the evening of the 20, uh, November 22nd. Yes, if I know that I don't see anyone here from health services, but yeah, I, as I mentioned, I was working with uh, Sarah Curley Smith. It I mean, because because of the fact that they have a lot of these these records, um, they have access to a, a provincial, I mean, to the federal database called Water Tracks, and that was one of the exhibits that uh, Sarah had prepared. So yeah, if if uh, if we could loop them in somehow, and then um, yeah. It, it would be ideal to, to have someone from health services in myself, along with myself, um, helping to, to okay. craft I'll, the wording. I'll follow up and, and make sure the appropriate people are, are uh, as part of that thread as we prepare for the 22nd. Okay, yep, sounds good. Okay, so we got time frames. we're good, we're good. Okay, thanks, Rod. Okay, thank you. Amazing. Okay. Um, just looping back, Brooke, do we have uh, Chris available yet or are we moving into Jill? Um, we can move into Jill. Okay. This isn't here. <laughs> okay. We'll get another structure update from Jill. We'll just give her a second to come online. Get set up. There you are. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to give the table a uh, verbal update on Gunjukwa. There are things moving and happening because we're still in the preliminary study period until December 16th, but the council table wouldn't necessarily mean me see, sorry, the um, movement that's being made on the administrative side. So I just wanted to give a verbal update about some of those things. And actually counselors may have noticed some of the revisions to the agenda and this particular agenda and the layout. So there are um, there's movement in several areas on the administrative side to streamline some of this um, during the preliminary study period. So the first one you see in, um, over the last couple of meetings was the director reports and the director reports are in the Dropbox. There was a, a changes made to the director reports and the information that's included in them. So the director reports, we're going to um, have them follow the schedule as found in the full council meeting schedule. So if you remember, and I can send out, um, send it out again, but if you remember in during the preliminary study period, the um, the schedule for it is the, uh, during political liaison on the second um, Monday of the month, there was four key areas that that would be presented. And in those four key areas was uh, well-being, which is health, um, community supports and services, which is social, justice and education was the other one. So those key areas would be presented at the political liaison. Um, information related to that area at the political liaison of the second uh, Monday of the month. The fourth Monday of the month included lands, economy, uh, governance, and um, there was there's a couple areas. So that's the structure we're trying to follow um, in terms of your director's reports. So if you looked on the agenda today, you would see in there that director's reports were related to those particular areas if they were submitted. In saying this, we understand the fluidity of um, changing dynamics. You know, just you just seen it actually with the water, with the water situation and environment. Environment would not normally come on to the political liaison agenda um, until the uh, political liaison of the fourth Monday of the month. But given the Time frame for what's happening, it has to be pushed up. So we understand the fluidity. So not everything is going to flow as nicely as we would like them to flow, but that's the nature of it. Um, the directors will also be giving verbal updates to this table. So they'll be presented, they'll be um, included or being present at this table beginning November 28th. And they'll be giving a verbal update in four key areas political advocacy, community events, 
legislative or policy changes in high spending approvals. That's scheduled to begin in November on November 28th or the next political liaison. Again, we're trying to streamline things a little bit and have um, more communication with directors in the area of political advocacy, community events, um, and legislative policy changes and high spending approvals. So again, that's to begin November 28th. Um, the CEO and staff will also be presenting their report um, scheduled to begin November 28th as well with that report. So again, the CEO in the, and staff that are is as appropriate will be presenting that uh, as a verbal update as well. And I think there'll be other um, pieces as well associated with that. And an example would be the community complaints and feedback report that would be coming because we started that whole process prior to um, Joel coming on board. Now we have Joe on board that does a portion of, of it, but um, council is still um, very much and sh should be involved in all of those pieces. But it'd be good to look at maybe some of the um, overall information that has come out of doing that. The other revision that I already mentioned is the revisions to the agenda template itself. And you would have seen that in this agenda template where you see the four key areas, which was well-being, um, uh, community supports and services, justice and education. And you see director support reports under each item um, attached in the Dropbox so that you can read them. The other piece that we were looking at is having a band council resolution accept these director's reports as information. And, and you can, um, you know, again, you could read at your leisure when they put them in the Dropbox. Beginning in with the November 28th meeting, a copy of the agenda will be sent to SAT um, and so sad of where as aware of what the agenda is and the reminder of the director report deadlines, but also letting them be aware of what's on the agenda if they want to listen in or if they have questions or trying to bridge that communication um, between directors and the this council once again. We're not quite there yet in terms of um, the Gunjukwa structure whereby counselors would take a file. Counselors would have direct communications, but we're working to try and figure out how we make um, smaller Gunjoka groups for various follow files. Although you already see it in action really with Mother Earth and the environment, and it's already happening in, in key areas, it's already occurring. Um, just to let everyone know, another survey will go out to SAT and the um, council the week of December 1st um, for uh, that survey will also talk about what has been going on today in the process changes or the impacts of that, if, if you see any. And, and that will be included in the final report, which uh, this preliminary period will be completed on December 16th. So just your, so you're aware, there'll be another survey, but I'll make sure that it's in a format that you can access if you're more comfortable filling it out by hand or if you're more comfortable with having it in a Word, Word document, then I'll make sure that I do that in addition to having it in the, in the other form that I had it previously. Um, just to update you, the community communications has went out for the midterm report to the community um, last, late last week. So that has been completed. And also work on a professional development and training series is underway in the area of governance um, were one of the key topics and we've heard it both from senior administration and well, sorry, I've heard it both from senior administration and in this table is the political versus administrative advocacy items and the overlap that occurs. So as we uh, design and put together this um, to per professional development training series, we're gonna be looking at broadly uh, political advocacy, broadly governance, and then moving down to these more finer uh, details that, you know, people are trying to work through. And, and really, it's, it's an issue of balance. Um, because there's no, it's not simply black and white, it just, it just simply is not like that and shouldn't be. Um, we have to do 
um, and be responsive what's best for Six Nations rather than maybe what other models see and what other models do. Our interest is making sure that what we do here at Six Nations is best for Six Nations and a model that will work for us. So to let you know that professional development training series is um, hopefully we're looking at three to four modules and um, set to begin late January, early February of next year. So I see there's a hand raised. Yeah, go ahead, Hazel. Yeah, Jill, I was just wondering if you could forward all of that information in Word, because myself, I would like to print it and keep a, a record of records for each department that, um, you know, you can easily reference. I know you can put it on your computer, but you always got to go find it if you remember where you filed it, right? I'd like to have it mine in a hard copy where I could... Uh, put it into a binder and have it like easy access for per department with all of this information. Okay, so sorry, I'm, I'm make sure I understand. So for the director's reports that are being submitted, you'd like them in a hard copy? Yeah. Okay. I'm Thanks. sure I'm sure we can do that. No problem. Would would other counselors prefer that too? Because we can make those, I think, and then put them in your mailboxes if that's okay. I see a thumbs up there. <laughs> I like reading hard copies too. So oh maybe that makes me older. <laughs> old school. Old school now. <laughs> okay, I, we can do that. Thanks, Joe. I see Helen with her hand up. We'll go to Helen. Helen, you're on mute. I would like hard copies too, because I have an office time trying to find things on this uh, <laughs> um, iPad. Because <laughs> they're not really organized well. They're just you put it in a way. My question is, I'm confused with the council's reporting under this new process. Some councilors are briefly reporting verbally at a council meeting. Some councilors are writing brief reports and sending them to council. I'm writing reports and submitting them to Brooke because I understood our reports are supposed to be discussed at council. The concern I have is I had some reports brought to council last Tuesday at the council meeting, but I've got no follow-up. Like who's supposed to be following up when you bring reports and make recommendations? I've got no follow-up to my recommendations in my report from last Tuesday. I don't know who's supposed to be doing it. I don't know if anyone's done it. I don't know. I don't know. So those are my questions about the council reporting. It should be consistent. And I thought that's what this process was going to do, was make the reporting consistent so that we were all doing the same thing. But who is recording the recommendations at a council meeting and who is supposed to be acting upon them? Those are my questions. Great questions. Um, now that you say them, I have them too. Jill? Um, certainly. I, I believe that one of your recommendations has been acted up upon because the, we do have a delegation this morning that's scheduled to attend that um, is doing presentation from the Chiefs of Ontario regarding the housing. So that recommendation has been followed up upon. But saying that as we build this, one of the recommendations uh, initially going forward with this project was to have counselors begin to do the reporting. We initially um, advanced that counselors could do a verbal report if that felt more comfortable to them, or they could do a written report. We provided a template for that written report. Um, and we gave the option again, if counselors felt more comfortable using a template that they've used previously, then certainly they're able to do that and to bring it forward again, because this is, a, and okay, and this piece was based within the election code. 
that election code requires elected um, officials to provide written reports regarding any external um, meetings that they attend is uh, Six Nations uh, representatives um, from this table. So that is the election code requirement. Because that we weren't seeing that on a consistent basis, we were asking that council, you know, at this point is a is a step toward making that bringing that to fruition. You know, a verbal report would suffice at this time. A written report would suffice at this time. But certainly, with the um, with the anticipation of councillors providing written reports as per the election code. That's the way, the direction we were moving in and hoping that councillors would take the, you know, take the initiative to provide those written reports as is their responsibilities under the election code. So we didn't give a hard and fast rule with regard to this. What we simply did was reminded and uh, was reminding everyone in, you know, of, of that uh, responsibility under the election code. When uh, materials come in, such as recommendations, and, and Helen, you, you did a good job of, of your written reports and we really appreciated that. And we looked at them. Again, as Chief Hill mentioned at the last meeting, we weren't quite clear. We didn't wanna step over our bounds about you know, your written report and the format you chose to uh, submit it in. And we haven't really put together the piece of uh, the band council resolution if there's a resolution that needs to come forward with it. We haven't put that together yet in terms of a template, but certainly we didn't want to overstep or um, assume certain things that were was coming from a written report that simply wasn't a recommendation that that counselor was making. So there are um, areas that we still need to work on to smooth out the process. And we are working on those areas to make sure that they are a little more smooth as we move forward. Just a secondary, maybe? Okay, yeah. And, and one of the problems I'm facing is uh, because I'm doing written reports and presenting them to council, I'm feeling I'm feeling like I'm taking up council's time because I'm the only one doing this. I feel like I'm taking up council's time with all my reports and my recommendations. So I feel kind of, I don't feel comfortable doing that. If nobody else is gonna do it, I don't feel comfortable taking council's time on the agenda to talk about my report. So that's how I'm feeling. I don't know that you're taking up council's time. I, I, I'm of the view that this is the areas where council should be focused on. And, and I actually thought the, the way we ran last week and uh, focusing on your reports was fabulous uh, and a good use of council's time from my perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll leave it there. Um, I see some other hands going up. Um, I have um, Hazel, and um, Audrey, but just before I do that, I just wanted to kind of close the door on on um, just making sure Helen, you got everything you needed uh, uh, in terms of responses. Yeah, okay. Okay, next I had Hazel and then Audrey and then Shaylin. Yeah, Helen, I would just like to say that your reports were really well done. And had you not written those reports, the detail in which you provide it gives, gives a counselor more information. And I thought that was good. And that's precisely the reason why I want to get a copy of all the reports written so I can keep a, a binder on those, like for easy reference, like if um, you have a department uh, portion of each, of each of the departments and the counselor's reports, it's all concise in one book. And, yeah, I appreciated your reports. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. We'll go to Audrey. Yeah, Helen, I uh, appreciate your reports as well. You were very clear and um, it took a lot of work to do. So thank you for that. And I, I submitted a report yesterday and it was on our uh, retreat from the uh, Grand River Post Secondary. 
and for three days. And there's only so much you can report because they're separate from council. So the reports are gonna look different. You're allowed to say some things and there are other people that you're not allowed to say things to. So I asked and the report that I gave was what I was allowed to submit. So we have to work with the, uh, the group that we're attending as well. And I think that as the time goes on, more counselors will be doing more reports because uh, people haven't gotten to those, a lot of those big meetings yet. So I think that's gonna come and it's gonna grow. And um, I felt good after putting that report in last night because it, it lets you know where I was for three days. We worked really hard and we're working in the best interest of the, the students on this reserve. So um, all the work is, is accounted for. So I, I'd like to know how far out uh, meetings should we report it, be reporting on? I've asked for the Native Advisory Committee that I sit on with Grand Erie and they are prepared to do an executive summary for me um, so that I'm not able to do my own notes because they wanna be in control of what is um, being transmitted from the Grand Erie Board of Education. So I have to respect that. I have to live with inside their boundaries. And uh, the same thing with other committees that I'm on. So I can only do what my parameters are given to me. And I do respect that and I'll continue to send reports out. And if uh, they're longer, and what I'd also like to re recommend, it's similar to what Hazel is saying. Those reports are good to have, but I think it's also a good idea to take all the recommendations out and have them in an action folder. We at one time had an action portfolio. Who was going to, what was the recommendation? Who was gonna do it? What was the timeline, et cetera. So we had monitored it and it was like evergreen. And it was there until that, that recommendation was, uh, had a solution to it. And what's, what was the solution and what was the date of the solution? So we have, can even go steps further like that too, Jill, to, um, so that we are kept abreast of the, all the recommendations because sometimes we come and meet those recommendations um, and the discussion is just that and it gets lost and we can't afford to lose these recommendations, especially when they affect our community. Yeah. Well. Thanks for that, Audrey. Next, I have Sherry Lynn. And I guess that's where I'm at, um, just along those same lines in the sense of um, sitting here doing this and working on this and some of the exercises that were, were given to us, what would be long-term, short-term um, things that we would like to accomplish. And we only have a year left. And I'm really looking at, okay, where are these um, long-term and short-term goals that we had put in um, months ago to be start working for certain things, um, to get safe beds here, to get maybe the RAM clinic here, to get things like that, start politically to start moving these things. And I guess I'm, I'm the one, get, I'm getting very frustrated because um, people are dying and things are still happening and we're still trying to figure this out. So we really need to um, get a handle on this ASAP to start moving things um, forward in a short term, but in a long term um, uh, situations that have been brought up to our attention when this first all came about. So where in these are at. So that's what I'm looking for. So movement on that. Thanks for that, Sherry Lynn. And I think the the, um, the retreat would be a great spot for, for us to go forward on that. So I got some more hands. I'm going to go back to Jill and then Hazel supplement and then um, Helen. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Uh, first, I want to just acknowledge um, Councillor Paulus Bumbrey's words. I do hear you. And um, I've written down, um, you know, some of what you recommendations that you made in terms of this evergreen document so that we can track this. Certainly, we'll be doing that. I think it's important. So thank you for that. Secondly, um, Sherry Lynn, I also hear what you're saying in terms of the long-term and short-term goals that this council filled out a, a number of months ago. We were moving forward with having the coordinated meeting between senior administration team and council 
to uh, flesh some of that out. But given counselors upcoming schedule with uh, priorities included on their agenda, it was felt that we couldn't then have that meeting with the time within this current time frame to be scheduled when the council is going to be discussing that further at their, another meeting upcoming. So that's why that was kind of just placed on hold for now until council has their meeting. Thank you. Okay. Next, I have Hazel and then Helen. Oh, do you want me to go to Helen first? Yeah, go ahead, Helen. Yeah, um, in terms of what, what Audrey was saying, and I've been saying this, I don't know for how long, counselors are sitting on these external committees. And the purpose for us to sit there is to report back to council what's happening with those external committees with the issues relating to our community. The big issue I have with sitting on these external committees is like Audrey said, a lot of times you can't report back to council because you're bound by confidentiality. And main, mostly that's the really important stuff that council needs to hear <laughs> is what is going on, what are they doing, what's the impact to us, et cetera, et cetera. If we can't report on those, why are we sitting there? And that's the big question I always have, because if I can't report to council on what's going on with these committees and what they're doing in relation to our community or what they're doing in relation to our kids or people, et cetera, I don't know why I'm there. So that's the big issue I have because so many of them are really bound. They don't want you to tell nobody nothing, but it's impacting our community and as counselors, that's why we're sitting there so we can find out what it's doing to our communities and what's going to happen to our community. What's going to happen to our kids? What's going to happen to this, this, and this? But if we can't report at the council, how are we supposed to work with it? How are we supposed to, you know, why? I don't know why we're sitting there. <clears throat> That's my big question. Because I'm sure a lot of the stuff they're doing in closed meetings or under confidentiality should be reported to council. We should know what they're doing. If it's going to impact us, our community and our kids or whatever. So that's the big concern I have with this whole external committee process that we've been going through for I don't know how long because to me it's just not working. Thanks for that, Helen, and, and great points. Um, I see Audrey raised her hand, but first I'm gonna to go to Hazel and Melba, um, as I think we got some continuity on this. So Hazel. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the fact that um, what Audrey said, she spent a whole weekend on a retreat, like qu quite a few hours. I'm just wondering, and when that kind of happens, um, Normally, when you go to meetings, they go to town, et cetera, you're paid an honoraria. What happens if you're at home and you're taking all your time on a weekend to be at a retreat? How does that work? I think that was directed at you, Ajit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have the, the answer. I'm just asking a question. Uh, it works the same way. It's a flexible. It's like right where I'm at council right now. Not everybody's here. Some people take time to do it virtual. No, no. This is not not the council meetings I'm talking about. about like it, when you go away. Say, for instance, if you if you where would you have been had you gone? I would have been in Niagara Falls. Okay, so then. If you, you went to Niagara Falls, you would get an honoraria. However, if you didn't go and you were home all weekend being on a virtual retreat, you're still doing the same thing if you're home or, at, or there, right? And you still get the honorarium. Oh, so you, get, you do get it. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Working. But that was for another place. Is that what happens with council? 
yes, it happens with council because people are home line virtual. We've been basically doing Zoom for the last two years and attending meetings. But virtually yeah, I understand that. I understand that portion. What I'm ref referring to is if something is set up, say in Niagara Falls, Toronto, Ottawa, et cetera. And if you join virtually and say if it's an, a night meeting or whatever, is there honoraria for those attendants, even though you're doing it virtually? Yes. There is. Shall we do it? I don't, I don't sound right. So, can we go on? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I get the question now. It's if, um, so like Chiefs of Ontario, if we all chose to do that virtually, do we still get that honorarium? I think that still needs to be discussed, no? Because I don't think we talked about that. Because it's never happened before. I think yeah. Well, it's gone, but we've been subjected to. Um, you can join only virtually, but say if it's in the evening and you're at home, you're joining and you're still at a meeting on behalf of yeah. people, no matter what it is. Okay, let's, um, Jill, can you note that? Um, and because I think that would be a policy change on our end, um, just to, for further discussion uh, as we go through. I see a thumbs up. Okay, uh, next I had Melba and then Audrey. Hi, Melba. Yes, I, I have a question uh, concerning <clears throat> uh, meetings with family. A lot of times they're, I guess, very confidential, let's put it that way. Um, whether they're homeless or not enough help. Um, I'm questioning whether there should be consent forms signed because uh, it's, as I said, it's very confidential. It could involve the settlement agreements. That's still happening, by the way. Um, they're still trying to apply. And then the day schools and then the homeless, all those things can involve a lot of family members when they need help. So I'm questioning Jill, should we be carrying around consent forms where they sign? because not always are we virtual. We're in person at the person's house. Certainly, I can bring that question forward um, to the appropriate personnel within the administration to find out whether that is a requirement. Repeat that, Jeff. I said I, I'm going to bring that um, question forward to appropriate people within the organization to be able to get an answer for you. You came okay, over. Uh, could I further say? Yes, that's fine for organizations, but I'm talking, I think we already do that within organizations when it's necessary, but I'm talking families, consent. To say, yes, you can talk to me. Yes, you can take this back and help me get some, some solutions to what my problem is. So you're asking the question whether you as an elected official needs to get a consent form signed from the community members um, that you're uh, discussing an issue with so that you can maybe help them follow up. Is that, is that correct? Am I understanding it correctly? Yes, that's what, that's what I mean, Jill. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, that's illegal, so we'll we'll look into that a little further. Shut you off. 
this is fun. Okay, are we all muted and back on? Okay, um, so good good um, discussions both on the honorarium side as well as on the consent side. So we got some follow up going up. Um, next, I'm going to go back to Audrey. Thanks, Nate. I just wanted to clarify my report in my report last night. I stated what we did. We updated all of our policies. We then uh, uh, helped create a 2023 uh, board planning module. And the 2022 will be released to council and presented to council, as well as it will be on the website. So the things that we've done will be shared with council. So there is uh, sharing will be going on and you'll know what's going on at post-secondary. Yeah. Well. Thanks for that, Audrey. Okay, we have no further hands, um, but really good discussion. Um, as we look to kind of close this out, I'll give the final word to Jill. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, counselors, for providing your feedback on this particular update. Again, we're in a preliminary study period, so this is all, um, you know, this is a work in progress, really. So again, things aren't going to flow smoothly or as easily as we would like, but I think all of us are in the best interest are having a governance structure that is to the best benefit of Six Nations. I think we're all on the same page about that and how we go about that um, will be determined, I think, as we move forward by this council um, moving forward. So thank you for that feedback. I do appreciate it. Thanks for that, Jill. Um, moving us into the next uh, area, just going to loop back in with Brooke to see if Chris is available or if we're moving into well being. Hi, Nathan. He's still unavailable, so you can move on to the next item. Okay. Okay, I might need some help on the next agenda item as all it says is reports due on December 13th. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> there. Yeah, good morning. I think Jill was speaking to this just previously about where we're raising these areas that are, you know, in terms of the those uh, large areas, well-being, community sports and services, and some of the pro our current program areas under there um, on this agenda. This particular first PL of the month was sort of the schedule for it. So, in some instances, uh, the the ones below the next items are are in the drop box. The reports were submitted, and they're there for council to review. Uh, there's no political advocacy from those those particular program areas, so they're not attending today. However, health services, um, we are actually switching the schedule a little bit because I know Councillor Sherry Lynn and I and, and Greg had a meeting with, with some representatives from health and there's some advocacy that could be uh, coming forward, but we're gonna schedule that for the 28th. So that that the health and well-being portfolio or area is specifically the first PL of the month. So that's why the date is there for the next report. But we will have an item on the 28th related to family health team and the, phys the sh physician shortage issue. So just to, just to note that there will be an item on the 28th from health, but they're standing item wise, it will be a report in the Dropbox. And if there's advocacy specific to that, they will come to the meeting on the 14th again. Is that right, Jill? I think I got that right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> that's correct, Aaron. So I talked about the fluidity of what happens for political advocacy. And we know that sometimes it happens very quick. And this is an example. But those director's reports, we were trying to keep them on the schedule because SAT members need to know when their director's reports are due for them. So for the next director report, 
that would have been due and is due on December 12th. But like Darren said, we know the fluidity of this particular area. And so we have to accommodate that so that this council can uh, make decisions that they need to make in a timely manner. So saying that there's going to be a health coming forward on the agenda on the 28th, even though it's not in the in the right in line with our beautiful schedule we have laid out, but it never works that way. So yeah. Thank you. Gotcha. Clear as mud. Uh, uh, going to question to Melba. Yes, coming back to, I'd like to come back to the consent form that I mentioned. When I'm talking about families, I'm talking about community. I am not talking about my family at all. Thanks. Yeah, that's been noted. And um, uh, just as we kind of look at the, the the legal aspect, I think that's what Jill referenced was just taking that back and, and getting uh, uh, some of those legal aspects uh, completed. I had nothing to do with uh, individuals' conflicts. It has mostly, mostly to do with um, confidential information being released. So that needs legal. So that's the work that Jill's going to do has nothing to do with conflict of interest. Just to separate that out. Apologize, Council. I only have one screen. <laughs> okay, next on the agenda, we had community, um, what was it? Community services and supports. Is this the same as the last one? Because I see there's a motion on this one. Or is there somebody to give the report? Uh, Nathan, Darren, sorry. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, the reports were submitted there, so they're there for information. So Normally, what we do at committee at the community level previously was we would have uh, the the reports accepted as information uh, because there's no specific political advocacy. In which case, the director would be present. So we're just accepting these as being submitted on time and available in the Dropbox for council to review. You can have subsequent quest questions, of course. So if you have a chance to review them at post meeting, just just provide the questions to our office and we'll follow it up with the directors. Okay, thanks for that, Darren. So I am going to go and, and kind of pause. So the the health services report wasn't in, but uh, my understanding is this one was provided. Is there any further questions? Or did we read the reports? Do we need more time to read the report? Question coming from Sharon. Well, I guess, I guess so, you know, and I think this is the whole part of, you know, the process and stuff and um, having these in the Dropbox and where we put our um, comments, I guess, as Darren just stated back to him. <laughs> so just for full council to understand what the process is and knowing that these are in, going to be in the Dropbox and now we can, um, if we have um, comments, I guess we give them to Darren. And um, I'm glad and thank you for letting us know what the process is and, and what we need to do as um, counselors, because I wasn't um, too sure. Thanks for that, Sherry Lynn. Uh, I'm gonna go to Greg. Yeah, just to follow up um, what Sherry Lynn was, um, was saying is that, um, yeah, I just had a couple questions, um, just basically for her background. Or from my own knowledge, um, for example, in the and uh, Darren, you can probably kind of clarify how the procedure would be. For example, um, in the justice uh, director reports, uh, he had some bar graphs um, showing um, 
there was a high volume of family violence incidents in our community. Um, it was it basically uh, it was probably the largest bar in all in the in the graphs that were shown. Um, my question was: Is that is there a breakdown of those those family violence incidents as to some uh, root cause? Maybe, for example, were they alcohol or drug related? And it would be uh, just the, just for my own no, knowledge, it, it, the procedure of asking that question: Would I bring it before council, or would I just go directly to you, Darren? Thank you. Okay, to go, Chair. <laughs> I'll just jump in. <laughs> yeah, give it. Yeah, uh, yeah. That that's correct, Greg. And great, great points, by the way. Um, and I think that you know the fact that some of the directors have come along a long way in terms of what they're providing. And it's it's always a question of how much detail, right? So if there's some, so like you say, the underlying causes, what's the strategies of the of the other service areas that we can do to support those families and individuals? So there is that collaboration piece of it. Um, so yeah, if you could provide, you just provided it to me now, so I can go back to, to Tim and, and have that further broken down, unpack that a little bit and see what other strategies that he's either leading or a part of to address the, that increasing trend or that trend that's very, very prominent. So that's exactly how we, we would work it. And just one other point, Chair and, and, and Greg, and uh, you were party to the meeting we had with Family Health Team last week on that, on a specific issue. And then I've talked to Jill about this as well and the Chief about if there's a need for counselors to come together with directors and myself or one of my team, uh, we, st we still will do that uh, on, a, on specific issues. I think it's more efficient to do that. So if something comes up that needs addressing really quickly, we can pull a meeting together in between our regular scheduled meetings to really work through a specific issue. I think it's more, more effective that way. Um, anyways, I, I, that, I just wanted to offer that as well as another pathway uh, for us to come together and address things as they come up or any questions, uh, questions that you have. Thanks for that, Darren. And, and I think this is gonna be kind of that um, work through and progress and work through by trial, right? So the the process as it's kind of laid out now will likely change as, as we continue to perfect um, the, the information flows and, and uh, also kind of start and I, I feel this will start happening as directors will start anticipating where we're coming from as well, right? That's the working relationship. So I think there is that nat natural progression uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I don't see any further questions on this. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> First of all, I couldn't hear Darren too well. It's kind of muffled and there's echo there. So sometimes I can't hear what you're saying, Darren. So if I ask a question, which you've already explained, uh, I certainly apologize. But I'm questioning um, in the Dropbox, is these reports from our services? Why are not the directors or alternates available to answer questions directly from the counselors. We're talking the community that's listening and may have some of the same questions that we have or learn from the questions that we have and the answers that come forth. So if we're gonna accommodate the community, I would think we should be accommodating them there also. I'd like to hear the comment, Darren, if I can make out what you're saying. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try and talk. Can you hear me? I'll stop and make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Melba? Okay. So I see, I see nods. Um, yeah, I think, I think even Jill kind of laid that out a little bit that we, starting on the 28th going forward, we will have directors available. I mean, more specifically about issues that come up or political advocacy. But we, I talked to Jill about this as well, and we, we thought, well, maybe we could have them available to, to directly answer questions for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes kind of a thing, not go through the entire report, but to be able to answer questions. So, yes, that's the plan going forward.
Okay, thanks. Um, so just for clarity, um, is there a need um, to go through the motions in uh, recommendation 9-1 and 9-2? Or was this just to get a better understanding and, and um, of the process? I'm a little confused on that. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's it's a question of whether council has had an opportunity to review the reports that are there, um, so they accept them as information. It doesn't mean that it's the end of it. Like if there's more questions that arise after, that that can still be provided, but the information uh, they're submitted as information, just sort of acknowledging that they're there um, and that they're comfortable with what's there. If not, we can defer it to the next meeting for for that that purpose. Okay. Um, just for clarity, I'm going to suggest we defer to the next meeting, um, just so that now that we have the understanding as councillors today, yep. um, we'll defer to the 28th for the passing of the the motion in 9 and 10 and 11. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Just want to confer with council. That's the understanding and everyone's good with that. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay. Okay, so that takes us to, uh, actually, I'm just gonna stop and make sure there's no further questions as it relates to the justice reports that might've been there or the education reports. And again, we're going to do the first. So Audrey? Another question. It's, 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 it's a statement and a request to the community. We have uh, put a posting in for the education manager for lifelong learning. And then we're trying to encourage people from Six Nations to apply for that. We have our previous um, education manager who is now on maternity leave, which is wonderful. So we need somebody in there to help steer the ship as well. And we're also looking for an academic lead. So if you're interested and you have a, some time to give, it's a well-paid job. So please apply. Nyawa. Okay, thanks for that, Greg. Got you next. Uh, yes, hi. I just had a uh, couple of questions concerning the education director reports. On the, um, I'm just getting familiarized with uh, with how it works, and with uh, there was a, a report by Othello. Um, and one of the things I noticed that uh, most of the respondents were female. Uh, I was wondering if there's any going to be any effort to reach out to the, I guess their male counterparts or the male parts of our community. Maybe they're just lazy and kind of like me and just ignore that. Um, but uh, I just I just saw that that kind of stuck out to me. Uh, the, the other uh, question was the uh, post secondary feasibility feasibility study. Um, my question was, has it been completed and uh, where could I find that? Thanks for that, Greg. Uh, any, Audrey has a response. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, the survey was put out for the entire reserve to respond to male or female. We did not discriminate. Unfortunately, it, it showed up that more women were, took the survey than, than men. So. If you're out there, men, and please, I mean, every time we put a survey out, would you please give us your input? We would appreciate it. And the second question is on the post-secondary report. It has had a couple of kinks. Um, the person who was leading it uh, took another job, so it was delayed. So now we're just looking at a time frame for it to set up. And as I said in my report last night at council, that, that post-secondary report, once it's approved by uh, the uh, Grand River Post Second Secondary Education Office, and then it'll be coming to council and it'll be presented here. So all that information, all that work, and then we'll get to see the trends, and then we get to see where the gaps are in post-secondary 
And then we'll probably be looking for some political advocacy. But all that has a process and we have to work through it. But thank you for the question. It was really good. Yeah. Thanks for that, Audrey. Okay, I see no further hands going up. So just as a reminder, we deferred 9, 10, and 11 till the 28th. Uh, and I'm gonna bring us into agenda item number 12, um, the Six Nations Cannabis Commission Indemnity ex Extension. Do we actually have a motion to, to consider on this? Just need Just need a little help on this. Here. Anybody? Um, Councillor Ray, it's Amy speaking. Um, I don't believe there is um a motion at this time. I know it has this item has been deferred for uh, quite some time since the summer. So there is a, a pile of uh, indemnities that have to be drafted up and updated uh, with regarding the turnover of staff and commissioners. So those will be forthcoming, but uh, I believe that the Cannabis Commission was going to be present to, to speak to this. So I'm not sure whether or not there was somebody in the waiting room from the commission. Okay, thanks for that, Tammy. Brooke? No, there's no one in the waiting room. Okay, so we'll defer. Um, Good. Sounds like you have some some work to do to get in terms of uh, getting a motion in front of us as well as the turnaround. So um, we'll have to do, defer until we get the information. Any questions there? Seeing none. Okay. We'll move us into um, councilor reports uh, in relation to the uh, ISC uh, gathering report. Uh, Councillor Helen Miller. Okay, just wait, let's pull them up. Okay. Um, me, myself, and uh, Greg attended this conference. Uh, Chief Hill was there for the one first day, but he wasn't there the second day. So what I've done is just listed a lot of different things that they were talking about and try to keep it as short as I could. I know it's long. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is uh, um, I'm trying to find it here. Oh. I never, I made recommendations, but it's up to council if they want to do it, because the majority of my recommendations are getting updates on all these issues, because when I was sitting there hearing all of these issues, I was thinking I'd never heard of this. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. So I don't know how much all of council knows about anything either. So the purpose of the ISC conference was for ISC to uh, spend two days telling us what they've done for First Nations in 2021, 22, what and how much money they spent on us. So they went through the, the that was the, whole, the, the two days, but they also highlighted different things, talked about different things that caught my attention because like I said, I hadn't, didn't know about them. Um, I, and I got the agenda items here for everybody to read. So what I've done is just highlighted some of the ones that I thought were really, might really impact us. Well, they all do, but I highlighted some of the things and, and throughout that conference, I, I wrote down here that we heard a lot of words like transformation, reform. Um, and we, you know, they kept talking about all of these things were community led or they were First Nations led. And I wondered if they were First Nations led, how come I didn't know about some of them? <laughs> So they use those kind of words to cover up what they're doing. And it's really about, it's really devolution. They're transferring everything to First Nations. And uh, I had wrote, a, I wrote about the Indigenous, Indigenous Services Act a few months ago, and that's where it's all coming from. 
the, the addition to reserves one, and I said I would elaborate on this from the last meeting. Um, so what I'm hearing, it's been CERNAC and it's is the Indigenous Service Act and CERNAC is the Crown Indigenous Relations and the North America Act or something, I don't know what it is. They've already started doing their engagement on the ATR and they've been doing it, I've heard, for the last three months. So they, they engaged with a lot of Native organizations and gave a lot of, engaged with a lot of government or departments. So they've been working on it. But to my knowledge, we never heard about this. I never, anyway, I don't know about the rest of the council, but I never heard that the ATR was going through this comprehensive review until I was at that conference. It's never come up at our table to my knowledge. So I was quite, you know, astute in listening to what they were saying. There was a lot of mention of the First Nations Land Management Act. There was a lot of mention about land codes. Uh, several First Nations have developed land codes, but I, you know, previous councils have always uh, opted out of not dealing with the First Nations Land Management Act and land codes. We've, we decided we weren't going to do those. But they mentioned it a lot when they were talking about land. So uh, that concerned me. Um, it concerned me also the big, the really involvement the AFN has in this ATR process. Like they've they're, they're co-developing the redesign of the ATR process. And uh, I know Ontario First Nations expressed concern that way back in July about this, but I haven't heard no more about that because I don't know if Ku is really up on this. I don't know. So the AFN has um, a Chiefs Committee on Lands, Territories and Resources. I don't know who from Ontario sits there. I think it was supposed to be, uh, no, I don't know who from Ontario sits there. Um, they also have a joint committee, a bilateral lands table. I don't know who sits there. And the mandate of this table is to make recommendations for changes to improve the ATR. They're going to be seeking a mandate at the Special Chiefs Assembly in December. Um, so they're really, really involved in this, this uh, review of the ATR and the changes they're making to it. So I, I don't know to the, why we have not gotten a lot of information on this. And the process is of the first year they were doing pre-engagement with, you know, figuring out how they're going to do First Nations engagement, what we're going to spend the money on when we get the money, because there's money that comes with it. There was 43 million designated to do the um, re engagement and the review of this. And part of that money was supposed to be going with the engagement. The other part was to catch up on the backlog of added to reserve requests. There's like 1300 added to reserve requests that are sitting there waiting probably for 20 years, 30 years, like hours. So, um, they're, this is the process. The second year, they're going to do it the engagement process. And we're supposed to be engaging with our community, I guess, on what we're going to do about this. And then the year three, the spring of 2025, they're going to make a submission to cabinet. So they're moving right ahead on this. Um, and they're supposed to be trying to catch up the backlog, but from what I was heard at the at the, this conference was it seemed like they were being put on hold until this was done. So that's that one. And we need to get updated on this. Like uh, we need somebody to come and tell us what's going on. Specific claims redesign, they're also doing that one, uh, specific claims for reform. Uh, years ago, I know councils always never supported the specific claims process because they said it didn't fit our land claims because our land claims were too comprehensive. 
they used to have a comprehensive claims process. And if I remember correctly, ISC is trying to, and CERNAC is trying to fit all of those, the claims into a, a one process. And Six Nations always said we didn't fit under there, but I haven't heard any more over the years whether what we were doing about any of this, but they are reforming it and it is going to impact us, I guess, if they try to fit us all into one process. So my recommendation was to try and get an, an analysis or update on the ATR and the specific claims. Uh, if we're going to participate, like what is going on. And again, uh, one of the major recommendations I made was we really got to sit down with the airplane caucus and start going through all these things and try and work together on these things because you're, you know yourself that the more voices, the louder we can speak. So something, this is something that we should be talking with the airplane caucus about. I'm surprised it hasn't come up at the caucus table, to be honest with you. And they don't know about it either. The next one is emergency management transformation. They're going to transfer emergency management to First Nations. Uh, I guess my question is, we haven't heard about this either. <laughs> so I questioned in my mind if Six Nations is equipped to take on emergency management. Um, I don't know how that works. Um, and we need to look into this too to find out whether, I, I'm assuming um, the fire chief is the one that deals with emergency management, does he not? I'm not even sure. Um, so we need to look into this, what's going on because I, I don't know if Six Nations is even equipped to take over emergency management. So we need to find out what's going on there. So I recommend that seeing if, Fire Chief Taylor could give us some kind of a update on this if he's heard anything. I don't know. Education, um, all they reported on education was that, like they said, they've got 10 schools. They reported on how many schools they've built, how many they're building. Um, they're doing, the, for all of the First Nations that took over education, which is everybody but us, pretty much, Tandanega, their, their regional, their 10 year regional agreements are up. So now they're reviewing those 10 year regional agreements and currently ISC is developing up to 20 regional agreements. They're doing, starting to do renegotiations of the agreement. And the renegotiation is what concerned me because when it comes to renegotiation, you know how that works. They're gonna try and cut money and the other people are gonna say they want money and this is probably where they're gonna start cutting money because they never cut money all these years because the, the agreements weren't up yet. So I anticipate they're gonna be cutting money to education probably for some of these First Nation communities. So they're doing that. It doesn't really impact us, but because we haven't taken over education, but I just want at least to know what they're doing. Post-secondary, this is another one of concern to me because uh, it says Ontario, they're, they're reforming post-secondary. Uh, they're claiming it's First Nations led. It says Ontario community engagement sessions have been completed. And I'm questioning why, what do they mean they have been completed? I don't recall anyone of post-secondary on the post-secondary education office or board or anything saying that they were doing community engagements. We've not heard anything about this from post-secondary, so I don't know what's going on here, but that's what we were told. Whatever their whatever engagement sessions they had are completed, so they're moving ahead with reform. So I'm wondering if we should get the chair of the post-secondary board or someone to come and fill us in on what is happening with it. Like, what do they mean by engagement sessions are completed? And what are they reforming? <laughs> I don't know. Social program, the part, same with the income assistance, Ontario Works, they're going through a big reform. They're, they're claiming their engagement sessions in Ontario have been completed as well. Um, and the AFN's involved in that as well. They're, make, they're co developing that as well. So I suggested that we should get uh, 
Sandy Porter to provide an info session to us maybe as to what's happening with, I know they've been going through a review for a long time, but I never knew they were this close to really doing anything with it. Now they're calling it reform. It's not review no more, it's reform. So I think we need to find out what's going to happen. One of the things she did say was that Ontario Works has to, they're, they're not going to be just sitting there signing checks anymore. They're going to have to do a lot more. So I recommend it we could get Sandy to come and fill us in on what's going on. Long-term care engagement, um, according to the, the IS, they've received, again, their, their First Nations-led engagements. I don't know who these First Nations are they're, they're dealing with, but I don't think it's us. If it is, I don't, I'm not that clear. So they really received a lot of funnies, uh, funding, so I just thought I would highlight, highlight that. Oh, child and Family Services, well, we know they've been going through a review for a long time as well, and they're getting reformed as well. An agreement in principle was signed on December 31st, committed to increasing the funding, so there's things going on there. Um, I don't know. I don't think, I don't recall ours coming in to us recently and uh, kind of updating us on what's going on here. So we might want to do that. The 40 billion child welfare settlement. Well, we all heard about that on TV and everything where the Human Rights Committee wouldn't approve the uh, settlement agreement because the federal government is trying to change it. And what I heard at the the IS conference from the different people is that the federal government was trying to cut some people off, people that have died, children and families or whatever that have parents that have died to cut them off from getting money. Uh, they were trying to reduce some of the payments to some of the, so that's why the Canadian Human Rights never approved this because of what the federal government was trying to do. So again, like, you know, if Arvis comes and talks about the other, the other uh, programs, she could probably fill us in on that. Children, youth, and families. Uh, if they received 10 notices of intent to exercise jurisdiction over child and family services and received three requests for coordination agreement discussions, I think we're probably doing this. But again, I have, we haven't had Arvis in for a long time to fill us in on anything. So I'm assuming that we're part of this because I know they were talking about this before. So we need to get an update on that. Jordan's principle, the biggest change that I could see to Jordan's principle and, I, and I'm not that familiar with Jordan's principle. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying it right, but the thing that I saw about the Jordan's principle is that it's gonna be used for capital funding now. I don't think it could be used for capital funding before. And it's, it can be used for capital funding um, for capital funding for projects that we might, people might want to do. I don't know, I guess construction projects or whatever. And that's why I wondered if it's possible that we, if we could use this, look into see if we could use it maybe to build some houses for single parents with children. I don't know what it means. Um, I just know that the capital funding wasn't, I don't think it was there before. Now it's there and it can be used for, um, I think also can use it or institution uh, um, other, um, I guess institutions or social service maybe, but the projects have to be already underway or they have to be shovel ready. And they can, they can fund needs assessments and feasibility studies. And I don't think all that was there before. So that kind of got my attention to that one. So we need to find out what's going on there to see if we can use it somehow. The water legislation, um, we know this has been going on for years. They've extended the deadline to, um, Make it, they, they, to, they've extended the deadline um, to, I guess, be consulted on this. 
I remember years ago when Consul and Mike had brought this to Consul and the, when everybody rejected the Save Drink of Water from First Nations Act back then, I remember that came to Consul and Consul agreed that we were, we were rejecting it. Um, but now the Drinking Water Act being tied into the First Nations Child Action Settlement Agreement, that's what Rod was talking about, I guess. So they're kind of tying those in together. Uh, so they're still working on developing First Nations water legislation in consultation with these First Nations. They're supposed to be doing this by December 31st, 2022. So I don't know if that has anything to do with those dates that Rod was mentioning that were coming up soon. So I thought I heard him saying something about December. So we might want to talk to Mike about this to see what he says. Health uh, is is planning to introduce indigenous distinction based health legislation in January 2024. This is also an extension from the original plan. It was supposed to be, I think it was supposed to be done either this year or last year. So they extended it to 2024. Again, AFN's heavily involved in this. Um, they're working on whatever. The AFN health sector meets regularly on health legislation matters with the Chiefs Committee on Health and the National First Nations Health Technicians. So I don't know who sits on the Chiefs Committee on Health from Ontario. I don't know who sits there, whether it's, I don't know what chief it is. So we don't really know a whole lot about this either, other than what we've learned from Lori over the, you know, over the time when she talks about health. Um, I don't know what distinction-based health legislation means, but that's what they're calling it. So in January, 2024, they're gonna be making legislation. So how involved we are in this, I don't know. Um, there is a, there was a preliminary discussion paper written by Malagabo Corbier that I mentioned, and it's called um, in March of 2020, and it was discussed at the First Nations Chiefs at the AFN in July. I don't know if anyone from here was at the AFN in July to hear about this health thing. And so somebody should have been. So whatever is happening with health was discussed. Um, and this paper from Nalagaba and Corbier is providing legal options. And basically what it's doing is telling, it's providing legal options whereby First Nations can make their own health care law if they choose to do so. Just, or, just Helen, just on that health thing, um, I don't know where you're getting that information that uh, health was discussed at the AF in, Ju in July because nothing was discussed at the AFN in July. Me and Sherry Lynn went and we can attest that nothing was discussed. Oh, well, it was supposed, according to what I was reading, it was supposed to be. No, all we heard about was Roseanne's issues with the, the executive. That's all we heard for three years. Oh, okay. So this, anyway, they made a, they made a legal options for, for First Nations to do their own healthcare law or um, a lot to, yeah, to either have a health care law that provides to all First Nations or First Nations to do their own. So I don't know much about this either. Um, and Helen, I'm just going, I have a few questions coming up, and um, I'm, okay. I'm just wondering if now's a good time to kind of field those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hazel. Yes, um, that is a lot of information that Helen is giving. Um, upon hearing it, I was I'm wondering to myself why wasn't all of us counselors there? If they if ISK was talking about what all they've done, and um, I think by having more counselors available to go and hear this this type of meeting would be beneficial to all of us. So that's one thing I. In hearing this, I think we should have all been there. The next thing that scares me is that ISK talk and code. Everything you hear, what they're planning, what they're doing, they use the words of transformation, devolution, and transfer. 
And basically, in a nutshell, they're telling us that they're going to give us everything that they're doing, but they're keeping our money. They're going to give you the 10 cents that you need to operate. So what I think our council needs to do is develop our own Six Nations constitutional statement for Six Nations. You need to quote some of the um, treaties that were handed down and put that in your bold statement and then state Six Nations position on all of this stuff that they're, that they're seemingly pushing to Six Nations, but not really saying it. That's what makes me say, I think they talk in code and they're gonna stay your boss till the cows come home because they want you to do all the work, you do all your own stuff, but they're gonna hang on to the money and tell you how to do it. So now it's our duty to tell them how we are gonna do it because we use the word sovereign how many times through this whole um, council over and over, but we haven't actually done our job in, in creating our own um, way of governing, I think, in, in terms of transformation. Transformation means you're going to do it this way. This is new. Here's how you're going to do it. When we talk about education, Helen mentioned something about the 10-year regional agreements um, and that those are up for uh, discussion now and probably cutting back on funding for those. When um, Ava was still the chief, I remember Max King. Remember that, Audrey? Max King came then and right here and said they were sorry they had ever taken on education because they didn't have enough money and it wouldn't give them anymore. So if that's an example of transformation, devolution, transfer, etc., that's what we're going to be in for. So that's why I think we need to have our own um, constitutional statement developed use those treaties that have been in place for eons and then say what we're gonna do in terms of being sovereign and stick with that instead of being told by ISK how you're gonna do it, but us telling them this is how we're gonna do it. And this is the amount of money we need to do it. So just a statement because I, I find this stuff is over and over again, talking about the same thing but never are we ever in charge. We got to do it their way or no way. So thank you. Thanks, um, Hazel. Um, a few more hands are going up. I, I see Sherry Lynn and Audrey. Um, but I, I just want to go back to one kind of observation that I'm seeing. All of this, and even in, in Helen's written report, I see AFN, AFN, AFN. Yeah. I attended the last two AFN meetings. None of this was on the agenda, nor was it in the breakouts. None of these topics. So my only comment is, and I'm going to leave it with a question. Are we too easy on the AFN? Why is it on these joint initiatives where the government and AFN are doing work why is it that the government is the only one that's providing us with any transparency on what's going on? Why is it when I go to an AFN meeting, these topics aren't on there? If they're doing changes, and I'll use the example on emergency management, it wasn't on the last AFN agenda in July, fire prevention was, uh, and we attended that breakout session but emergency management isn't. So my quasi kind of conspiracy theory is somebody is duping us and I don't think it's ISK. I'm just gonna leave it there. Right. Uh, Nathan, uh, while somebody else asked a question, I gotta run and get my charger and my phone dying here. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> so next on my list, I had Sherry Lynn, Audrey and Greg. 
and Nathan, I'm glad you brought those up because that was kind of my thinking. Um, and I guess it's the part where, what are we going to do here at Six Nations? Do we need to write a letter? Do we need to stay, send, and send it off to them, but also the governments to where we stand? Um, all the stuff that you just said, because, and like Hazel said, it seems like it keeps um, going round in circles. So I guess that's my question for this council is, are we gonna sit here and nip it in the butt and really sit there and, and write a letter or a statement? I'm not sure what it is, where Six Nations stands, but also to, to and send it to the governments that again, they don't speak for us, but they're sitting here uh, making all these wheeling and dealings and nobody knows any other information. And um, that just that, that's not just for us. That's right across the board for everybody in, in Canada. So very concerning. Um, I just want to put it up there. Not sure what um, this council wants to do, but I think we need to really take a harsh stand, like you said, um, Nathan, and we really need to hold them accountable. And especially like you said, there's no transparent anywhere. There's a lot of lying <laughs> that they're do that they're saying they're doing and um, haven't seen any of it. Comments. Thanks for that, Sherry Lynn. Um, next, I had um, Audrey and then Greg. Uh, thanks, Nate. Um, I agree with what my colleagues are saying. I think that we have to hold AFN accountable, and I think we should be having our political advisors uh, do more of the national and local politics of uh, First Nations, because we have to know not only what the government's doing, and we have to hold them accountable as well, but we have to know what our neighbors are doing, what the chiefs of Ontario are doing, what AFN is doing, and we have to put our political position forth, but we have to determine what that is. And in education, um, we have been working on that since 2017, and right now it's, it's treated as a portfolio because any, anybody or any group belonging to education has been uh, welcome to join with us so that we can work together on developing a, a, I guess, a more impactful education system we have now based on language and culture. So what we determined in Deloitte study was that we need twice as much money as we have now, and that's about 10, uh, 2.2 billion over 10 years. So unless we get the funding that we need for Six Nations students, adults, uh, we will not be taking over education. So I want to be very clear on that. But we have to know what we're doing. And I think the more people that work together, we have to get out of these silos. We need the information people have. We need thoughts that people have, experiences, expertise. And that's what's going to help guide us from our children, our youth, all the way up to our elders. So we do appreciate that. So those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Audrey. I'll go to Greg and then I'll pass it over back over to Helen after. So Greg, you got the floor. Oh uh, yeah, um, thanks, thanks Helen for a very comprehensive report. I was there uh, with Helen and um, I took like 10 pages of notes, but really they all say the same thing. I agree with what uh, the fellow counselors have been saying exactly. Um, you hear the same words over and over and over again. And it's just, you know, uh, I had wrote them down here. I, one page, I just wrote down words that I heard for just about every program. Well, we're going to identify, we're going to examine, we're going to consider, we're going to create, we're going to do this, we're going to do that model, we're going to we're going to bring it forward before legislation in 2025. Um, they seem to be the government seems to be throwing a lot of the native uh, bands into a collective. And then they throw them into a collective and then they just throw you a set amount of money and you distribute amongst yourself. Well, that's not going to work. We're all different. We have different needs. We're different regions. And it's the same rhetoric you hear year after year after year. And, and to Sherry Lynn's point where I think it, well, even, even when I said I was from Six Nations, because I'm new here, you could hear crickets. Nobody asks us what we think. Uh, nobody asks us for input. Uh, being the largest, 
were almost shunned. But by by the Chiefs of Ontario, I haven't been to the to the meeting yet. I haven't been to the AFN yet, but I'm I'm sure it's pretty much the same. And I think as councillors, if we do attend these meetings, I think we should make our positions known, our policy positions known. I don't know if that'll change anything, um, but I think that's not only from a standard policy statement that maybe the chief's office will release, but I think individually, if we get a chance to attend these meetings, I think we should we should tell other other bands what Six Nations is doing, what we want to do, and what we're going to do. So thank you. Thanks for that, Greg. Uh, good comments, and I think we're we're narrowing in on on the same page. Um, Helen, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to you. What, what I see, I think, what I see happening is uh, ISK and uh, and CERNAC are, I think they've really taken advantage of the COVID pandemic. While the rest of while the rest of us, like all the First Nations, weren't really meeting. You know, the chiefs would have the chiefs of Ontario would have meetings, but half the chiefs didn't attend because they had no internet connection, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's on Zoom. We're not going to meetings. We weren't attending nothing. They took advantage of that, I think. It just started moving everything forward so that here we are. Um, and doing my, when I was doing that, the report about the ATR, I came across um, some things with uh, under what I'm calling land management. This wasn't discussed at the uh, conference, but I came across these and I, it caught my attention because it said ISC is supporting Ontario Aboriginal Lands Association on the Indian Land Registry System pilot project. They're reforming the um, land registry system or modernizing it as they say. And uh, there's a lot of, it's, a, it's really involving the First Nations Land Management Act and the land codes. So, and anybody that signs on to the First Nations Land Management Act, it says they're no longer subject to 44 sectors of the Indian Act regarding lands. I don't know what those sections are, I didn't look, but. And then 22 First Nations are working on land codes. So I think this is kind of tying in. I'm thinking this is going to kind of tie into the ATR process as well. Uh, I might be too suspicious, but I'm thinking that in order to get land added to reserve, we might they might say we have to be on the be part of the First Nations Land Management Act, and we might have to do a land code. But I'm not sure. But it sounds to me like they're going to be connected. So, and like I said, previous councils never agreed to do any of those things. And Lonnie could probably tell us better why. But I remember it used to come up. Um, so those are really my concerns with that is um, because land codes, what land codes do is gives the First Nations um, authority to enact their own laws on land. So I think it, I'm still thinking they're going to be connected to the ATR somehow. This, they're working on it together. Another thing I come across was modernizing regulations on First Nations decision making. <laughs> They're modernizing us now on how to make decisions. So I was kind of concerned with that as well because um, it, it reminded me when I started reading what they're doing with making decisions be, being uh, referendum regulations because we have to make decisions through referendum according to this. I remembered something that we had heard uh, previously about talking about land and, and we, were, we were told there had to be a referendum. So I, I can't go into detail on that because I think we talked about that in the closed meeting, but it's again, I. I'm seeing all of this kind of like tying in together. Um, the, the regulations also is giving approval for people to use online voting for whatever, whether it be a land issue or 
elections, but we don't follow their elections anyways. We have our own. So it's really the, the, the Indian referendum regulations modernization is really, if you read it, it's really dealing with land use. And that's why I'm thinking it's all connected to the land management and it's all connected to, to the ATR. I think they're all going to connect somehow. That's what I'm thinking. But I, I might be overly suspicious, I don't know. Uh, so that concerned me, that's why I brought it to, to attention for you guys to read it. Um, so mainly these are, I guess these are all, and we got the letter from Minister Patty Hedgew highlighting some of these things that I'm talking about as well, that she's working on, so. I think we really need to get an update on some of these issues from our directors and their, just to find out what, it, what exactly is going on and what's being done about it. I just don't like the fact that most of the time the, the ISC kept saying and the community engagements were done, the community engagements are completed. They did community engagements. And I'm questioning who have they done community engagements with because I don't recall anybody coming to Six Nations to do community engagements. So we're seemingly to be left out of the loop someplace, unless the directors have done it. The directors may, maybe meetings with the directors is considered community engagement, I don't know. So I would like to get updates on these, some of these, I really think we need to. As far as uh, anything to do with land, like the ATR process, like I said, I'm recommending that we work real close with the Iroquois caucus and start working together on these, these issues. One of the suggestions had been from one of the chiefs at our housing meeting was um, we could make our own lab, do our own ATR process outside of what ISC is recommending. So that might be an idea to look at as well with the Iroquois caucus is developing in our own ATR process instead of uh, going with what the ISC is trying to do. Uh, and that ATR process that we talked about was not getting land added to reserve, but getting land returned to reserve. That's a whole different picture. So those are the kind of things we need to look at, but I'm just making recommendations and I'm just recommending that all of the different directors that relating to these initiatives may want to it might be beneficial for us to have an update on what exactly is going on with these things. Because like I said, some of it I heard and like Nathan said that, that the AFN, he said they haven't dealt with none of the health. I see now too that this community engagement thing that I had mentioned for the health, I think it's called what we heard. It's because, or somebody, AFN, I guess, it's supposed to be presenting that in December, and it's uh, it's, uh, it's regarding the health and what, what they heard. So if maybe they're not going to do that in December either. If they didn't do nothing in July. So That's you. Really, it's on the really money. Get on the ball here. I think we're, we need to get on the ball and find out what's going on with everything. And, and I just want to pick up on, on one of the action items you mentioned, Helen, which was um, working with the directors to get updates on this. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a quick uh, quick review of the AFN website and they bury, they have the information there, but it's buried. Um, and, and I just wanted to kind of give council uh, an update to back in 2018, the Assembly of First Nations very quietly sent out a notice to all First Nations saying, we're no longer um, sending out the briefing notes for each of our sectors. So directors will have to monitor our website. Um, so that was in 2018. So I actually went to their website and if you do enough clicks and you do enough searching, you'll find all of this information. I just found the ATR process information on there. So Darren, it might be advantageous and, and just picking up on what Helen's saying is, is to start um, letting directors know that they don't get faxes anymore from AFN, but they, they actually have to do their own due diligence and send, look at the websites. 
Um, you know, starting with something like Lands and Resources, getting Lonnie's team to, to look at the ADR uh, information that's on the AFN website and, and getting back to us on that. Um, so I'm just going to kind of leave that suggestion there, just building on what Helen's saying, because I think that's the starting point is, is having directors peruse the AFN website, pull the information and getting it to us. Um, I, I can all it myself for me, but uh, now that I know the information's on the AFN website, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go look for that. But that was something they did in 2018 very, very quietly. Uh, Darren? Uh, thanks, Nathan. And, and thanks, Helen, for the report. I think the other thing that we'll, we'll do, and we did this with your last reports too, Helen, we circulated to the directors uh, the, who are, they were appreciative in terms of getting that feedback and through your report and specific recommendations around those. See, these are all laid out in different sectors, so they will be directed to each appropriate director to determine the level of contact or even email outreach we've, we've received. Um, I know that with the distinction-based health legislation, they've been kind of pushy and trying to get us to the table on that. And we've been resistant. Uh, early in the early stages, Lori Davis Hill had made some connection with them, but it didn't get into like a full engagement. So we have to be, and what we can do is once we uncover what we have had, what kind of contact we have had in each sector, we can then say this, we, don't, we do not consider this engagement. We don't consider this consultation. You know, just to be able to have our ducks in a row in terms of this is where our participation in this in this and or yeah. non or non participation. So I think that that's helpful. I will definitely do that as a takeaway from this meeting is circulate your report and direct to those sectors that are affected or noted in there. I agree with you too, Nathan. Thanks. Well, I'm going to the Chains of Ontario this out later on today because I, I want to be there to see what. Because some of these things are coming up, I think. Not not all of them, but some of them. So I'm going to go. I wish I would have went today, actually, or last night, because they have three dialogue sessions today, and one of them is post-secondary. Um, I think the other one is health, and I think there's another one. I can't remember what it is. Oh, uh, language. I wish I would have went this morning. So I could have sat in on those dialogue meetings, but um, I just couldn't manage to do that go right away. So I would have been interested in the post-secondary one and the uh, the health one. So see what we come up with at the Chiefs Committee, I mean Chiefs Conference this week with any of this stuff. That, that's my report. Thanks for that, Helen. And and uh, like I said before, I do, do feel like these are uh, very, very useful for us in terms of uh, putting this puzzle together nationally and regionally, um, because we shouldn't have to do this. Just going to say that. Uh, any more um, questions? Because I think, oh, sorry, Greg, do you have a, is that a legacy hand or? No, I Okay, <laughs> legacy hand. Okay, so I we have the report here. Uh, we have some good follow up. The only other follow up I'm going to suggest, and maybe we put this into a motion, Helen, is uh, your suggestion on uh, sending a note to both AFN and ISC, uh, maybe by way of a letter, um, highlighting these positions. But now that I'm talking it through in my head, I think we have to get updated on the positions first. Get our uh, political uh, strategy together, and then we'll draft a letter to AFN and ISC after we get updates from each of the directors. That That's kind of the goal forward on this. I'm seeing some thumbs up, some heads nods. Okay. Timeline. Timeline for this, that's a good one. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take director. Like, the, the information is on the AFN website. I don't know how long it's going to take them to kind of get themselves up to speed on a lot of these items. Yeah. Darren, when do you think? Or do we just kind of put this in and weave it into the director reports? Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I was just going to make that suggestion. I think that they are probably quite aware um, of, of the status of all of these air in all these sectors, but I think the more, more critical issue for me is the level of our participation or engagement. Uh, and I think that's important that we, we, we discover that, first of all, 
and everybody's on, on on the same page and then we then we make sure that we refute that if there's an assertion made by afn that we we had input or you know what i mean so that's part i think that's for me that's the political side of it but uh for sure i think probably yeah end of this month i don't think it'll be that difficult of a chore to get those updates and we'll insert them in those reports so it, it'll be the 28th and then the following um pl meeting in december so it would be within the next three weeks i guess four weeks yeah, I agree with Karen. That was my concern was because they kept saying that community engagements were completed and community engagements were done. And I'm, I'm just wondering how much community engagement we did or if we did any. I don't know. Well, if you recall back in the AFN renewal process, they did community engagements with friendship centers, not communities. So <laughs> we always have to be uh, mindful of, of the trickery that's going on around here. Mm. Audrey. Yeah, I just do. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank Nate. Just to let everybody know there was a, a vast amount of community engagement on the post secondary feasibility study. It was done by Six Nations Polytechnic. And because they know all of our students and they know our families, they were able to get a lot of input. There's been surveys out, there's been one to one meetings, there's been uh, focus groups. And then the information has all been rolled up. In fact, it's even been uh, mentioned in the Lifelong Learning Task Force report that Council has for today. So it has, we have been aware of it, or most people have been aware of it. And once it gets rolled up, it has been delayed, been delayed a couple of times now. And once post-secondary gets the final report and approve it, it'll become the Council and it'll be shared. But the community engagement has happened and it was quite successful. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ajay. Okay, I don't see any further hands going up on this particular topic. So that takes us into agenda item. Oh, uh, sorry, I, Helen, just have one I just have one in regards to what Audrey's saying. If the PA, if post-secondary is, I mean, if Polytech has done an engagement in all of this, why would they not have informed us that this was happening? Because wouldn't we maybe want input? Or shouldn't we be knowing what is happening with our post-secondary education? Or being informed? Or when we read the report, it's going to be done. <laughs> I'm thinking. The community engagement was for students to find out from them and their parents and families what were the gaps in post-secondary education. It wasn't a political thing to come to council. It was for the students and the parents. And those so, are the people that they engage with, the people who are directly involved in it. And I have brought this to council before. People do know that there was a post-secondary study being done and that Polytechnic did the study. And I'm sorry, Helen, I, it, 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 um, I'm I talking about the issue. to hear about it. I'm but talking about what done, Iskit's saying. As soon as they get it approved, they'll be coming to council to share. They so, didn't interview uh, me. I don't have any kids that are in the uh, post-secondary system. They didn't interview me as a counselor because it's not political. No. Yeah. No, well, that, that's probably a different, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about is doing a post-secondary reform. That's probably different than what Polytech is doing. So I'm questioning whether the education office was involved in any kind of post-secondary reform that ISC is doing, because ISC is claiming they negotiated with community, I mean, they engaged communities. I think this polytech one you're talking about is a different, is a different one. That's probably just internal to us, right? No, it's all of 133 First Nations in Ontario engage their First Nations community in the post-secondary feasibility study. Chiefs of Ontario rolled it all up and they were prepared to present it at the uh, Chiefs Assembly that's happening this week, but now that has been delayed for the next Chiefs, all Chiefs Assembly. Oh, so it is the one with this is talking about the, so do, do we, is the report gonna tell us what the reform is that they're doing? 
What are they reforming? They're finding the gaps. Thanks, Nate. They're finding the gaps in education. What do the students need? Obviously, they need more money for a living allowance. They need more money for books. They need transportation. They need to have a, um, all the things that help them, like the technology, all the rest of that. Probably even need travel. So there's lots of things that they do need. And they need that emotional support. They need to have wraparound services. The report isn't hasn't been presented to us yet, so I can only speculate that that's what they're including. Okay. But at, at post-secondary is not talking about reform, we're talking about what are the gaps that need to be fixed in post-secondary education. Whether that leads to reform or not, I hope it does. I hope it leads to changes. I hope it leads to more money for our students because that in the long run is gonna help everyone out. And thanks for asking those questions, Helen. I do well, appreciate it. No, well, I just wanted to say when it's presented it at the conference, they were talking about reform. So I just wonder what it meant. What are they talking about reform? So that's why I raised that issue with post secondary. Okay, thanks. And, and I think that's good clarity to get um, as as we kind of move and, and actually this is a really good discussion as we move into um, the sector reports and, and uh, that last conversation that we just had so folks can go in uh, and get that information. Um, and like I said, I, I, I referenced that AFN went uh, paperless and don't send out faxes or emails to communities anymore. Um, Ku did that as well, and, and you can find their information on their website. So just a note for directors, uh, don't be sitting at your computer as, expecting an update from these organizations anymore because that doesn't happen. Um, they, they make you go to their websites for the information. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of our in our open meeting. Um, uh, I had no additional items from folks, so looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Audrey, seconder. Seconded by Sherry Lynn, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion has passed. Thanks to the community um, for being with us this morning and, and wish you have, uh, stay warm and wish you have the best day going forward.